Welcome. We love you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Uh, we pray that when we leave here, we'll be um, changed. Changed from the inside out. Changed from your word. Motivated. Hearing you. Seeing you. Walking with you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen, amen and amen and amen. <clears throat> A little bit ago, today we're going to talk about uh, vision and, and its relationship to culture. Um, and it's corporate, uh, but I, I hope that it's individual for you. I hope that the Lord speaks to you uh, through what we're talking about here today and that you understand going uh, forward uh, who we are, what we're about, why we're doing what we're doing, so on uh, and so forth. So uh, a little while ago, I watched a, a docuseries about Urban Meyer and how he took the Florida Gators to the national championship. Uh, how many of you are Gators? How many of you are Gators? All right. Awesome. This is the quickest way to split a church, just like this. It, it happens really quickly. Somebody said on the front row, go dogs. See, it just, it happens quick. It happens quick. Color of the carpet. I don't like it. I love it. Uh, happens that. So in, in the docuseries, <clears throat> he mentioned that culture's king. He said it over and over. Culture's king, culture's king, culture's king. And, and it really is. And there's really nothing wrong with saying culture's king because when you're building a ministry or a family or a business, if you're in corporate, you hear that all the time, culture's king. When we think about culture, like the, the culture in America, the culture in America, it is, uh, it's imperative uh, that Christians know that they have permission to engage with culture, that we, that we have permission. Come on, church. We have permission to engage with culture. You have permission to engage with culture. And <clears throat> culture isn't king. Let's just say it like this. Culture's king with a small K. Because we worship the king of kings with the capital K. With the king of kings. He ha he's, so, so here's how this breaks out. Um, the standard isn't what culture says can't be our standard. The scripture has to be our standard. The, the, the scripture has to be our standard. And <clears throat> we have to be biblical Christians before race, creed, or color, right? We, we really do. We're, we're not black and white Christians. We're all just shades of chocolate, right? And some are on the lighter side. On the darker side. We're all chocolate. God knows it. Jesus is calling somebody to Tampa camp. Just grab that for us. Just grab that one. <laughs> Didn't mean to point you out. Yeah, you read. No. <laughs> um, so the Lord, culture wants us to think it's king. But culture's not king. Christ is king. And, and, I, and I, I think, I know that we're caught in the middle because we don't, we don't want to be rude, we want to be arrogant, we don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want to offend, we don't want to, <clears throat> but, we, but we do have to stand. And most of Christianity is really standing for what you believe, not standing against what you don't believe. That's most of Christianity. But there is that verse in the Bible about salt and light. And salt is the preservative and light is the thing that shines in the darkness. And so <clears throat> just because culture says something is true or right doesn't mean it is. <clears throat> I just want you to think about that for a second. Culture is defined by time and people, and space. This is not defined by time and people and space. In other words, the Bible transverses color. It says sons and daughters. The Bible transverses time and where in antiquity, all the way thousands of years ago, the Bible speaks to people and says, that's not the way to live, this is the way to live. And different cultures do different things. And I think that we think, 
as believers that we can't believe differently any longer. So I want to tell you, you have permission to be counter-cultural. Yes. <laughs> some of you are like, huh? And some of you are like, ah. Counter, you can be counter, we have to be counter cultural. In um, China, traditional medicine is really um, valued, and so they will hunt extinct species uh, for the resource, the money. Money's always involved, by the way, you know this, right? Money's always involved. God didn't say that we would struggle against Satan, He said we would struggle against money. Mammon is a god. Uh, so they hunt rhinos, and, and they, they're extinct species, and they use the horns to make medicine. They hunt tigers. They're extinct species. They use the bones to make medicine. In the Middle East, they have something called honor killing. And honor killing means that a member of the family, usually a female, has dishonored the family, and so the family members are allowed to, by law, uh, murder them. You, you, it, so in America, we're, we live in a bubble, don't we? Um, but in the Middle East, this is a very, very it's centuries old practice. And so if you don't you know, go along with the arranged wedding or if you have premarital sex or if you're even violated as a young lady and you bring dishonor on the family, it's called an honor killing. But honor, you know how we name Sinful things, pretty names. It just, it's crazy what, what we do. And of course, everybody knows about what Germany looked like before World, World War II, that an entire, think about this, just like an entire nation thought it was okay to perform genocide on, a, on, on members of the population. Just incredible. Six million Jews perished during that time. And we got all this stuff going on with Palestine and Israel and all these things. And we've got college campuses, University of Stanford, saying that the Holocaust never happened. So there are people, people that lived through the Holocaust. They're very, very old now. Maybe some of their children. And they're standing there in the crowd. They've got tattooed numbers on them having lived through the Holocaust. And somebody on a college campus is saying, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We live in a strange time, don't we? Yes. Like we live in a... Doo -doo -doo -doo. We live in a strange time. What's it, that twilight zone? It is, really. <clears throat> um, in some places in uh, Asia, uh, some places in China, or some places now in Europe, uh, they practice something called um, FGM. And I will spare you. You can go look it up. Uh, what they do is usually young girls, young ladies, um, either partially or completely remove their female parts for non-medical reasons. And if you think about this, you think, that is the oddest, like, that's, str that's strange. There are cultures that practice cannibalism. If you can imagine that, there still are on, on, on the planet, cannibalism. But listen... We don't agree with that, do we? No. You guys are like, no way. My little Thea, my little granddaughter is two, and my uh, daughter says, say no way. She goes, no way, no way, no way. Oh. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't think that's right. We don't think that's good. We don't think that's biblical. We don't think that's, that don't, we don't think that, we know that's not in the God. We, we understand that, but, but the governor of the state of Minnesota believes that. If you don't believe me, Google Tim Waltz. It's awful quiet in this Methodist church. We're not a Methodist church, by the way. So of you are like, I thought we were Methodist. No, no. Spirit-filled, Bible-believing, on-fire, Jesus, heaven. Um, 
That's why it is ultra important that the church begins to equip believers, sons and daughters, to impact culture. To uh, not just be in the pew, but to be in the public forum. Not just to, to listen and hear, but to go and do. And <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna give the rest of my life to doing that. I'm, I'm gonna give the rest of my life to doing that. I feel like I got a second lease on life. Uh, honestly, uh, we had first Wednesday last week and I was running around like a kid at a candy store. I mean, I was, I had like lightning in my body. Like I couldn't stop. I was so frenetic. I was just like, dunk, 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 dunk. I, was, I was running around, words of prophecy, it was crazy. So <clears throat> the vision of the church is, to, is simple, to reach and teach. We want to reach people for Jesus, amen? And then we want to teach people who come who they are in Christ. Because if the body of Christ ever discovers who they are in Jesus, whew, that's, 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 that makes Satan really afraid. It's, it's very, very simple. It's very simple. We want to reach outsiders. We want to teach insiders. We want to move those who are outside, inside. You know, I mean, you can cut it, slice it a bunch of ways. Um, the, you might be asking yourself, well, why is that important? Why is the vision to reach and teach important? Because the tenor of Scripture has in it these two great commissions and a great commandment. And in the two commissions, the commission uh, first in Mark 10, and you don't need to put, that, you don't need to put it up, <clears throat> Jesus goes to the disciples and he says, all authority has been given to me. Now what I want you to do, and so church, what, what do you do? All right, I'm a Christian, what do you do? He says to them, I want you to uh, go out there and I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cleanse the leper. I want you to raise the dead, and I want you to cast out demons. In America, we say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> right? Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you mean? So <clears throat> I want to introduce to us today the fact that that is actual Christianity. Smart. That's actually what we're supposed to be equipped to do. How many of you would love to see miracles follow you? Yes. Hallelujah. Now listen, it's a responsibility. It's not to be taken lightly. And we never do anything. It's the Lord that we're hosting that does the work. Always. The other commission is the Great Commission. Go therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I've taught you. And lo, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as your... Okay, that's, that's love. So you have a commission sandwich. Is that okay to say that? You have the first commission, which is heal the sick, raise the dead, Cast out demons, take care of the leper. Now, what's the translation for that today? Take care of the marginalized. Take people who have stigma, love people, love people on the fringes, take care. You have that, then in between that you have love, that's the condition that we do everything in, and under that you have the great commission, go and make disciples, there's the, there's the sandwich. So that's the vision. You'd say, and if you hear any church, if you go to any church and they're far away from those three things, the two commissions and the great commandment, just run. Just because that's, that's what this, the entirety of this, this book says. What is a Christian supposed to look like? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the leper. Go and make disciples. So you'll know that you have become what Christ is doing in you when you become a disciple, watch this, and when you make a disciple. Amen. So you're a disciple maker. You're not just a disciple, you're a disciple maker. You're not just a tree, you're a tree that's planted, that is fruitful, that creates other trees. Okay. And so <clears throat> our plan 
is to grow. We want to grow to 15 because we want to reach, right? If you don't reach, uh, is, let me ask you the question this way. Is it okay to grow as a church? I know that bigger churches have a thing. We want to grow large and small at the same time. We want to grow large, do whatever God wants to do, and I'll tell you why in just a second. And then we want to grow small at the same time. So everyone who is at our three campuses or in this, you know, auditoriums and so on and so forth, but we also want you to be in a life group. We want you to be, we want you to know people and be known. We want you to share your lives. So the church, the church, especially the largest church in the world is a million people. It's a couple more than we have this weekend. <laughs> there's, there's a few. Uh, one of the greatest churches in the, in the world, Yoido, full gospel church in Seoul, Korea. And it's made up of cells. I think they have 17, 18, or that maybe that made it 10 years ago. They probably have 25, 30 services on a weekend now, all in person. But uh, hosting a million people is a, a huge task. Huge task. And so what God is saying to us in our plan is, I'd like for you to grow 15 campuses in the next 15 years. And since I'm 45, I'll be 60 then. If you believe that, I've got some land to sell you. It's in the middle of the state. I'll be 70 then. And uh, I don't, uh, I'm not certain about who, you know, exactly certain about who my successor will be. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of deja vu to be up here saying that because in March, I didn't know if I would, uh, if I'd be able to be back teaching or I believed that God was going to heal me. I just didn't know how or when. And so it is a little bit surreal to be here. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. So my, uh. My son, who's 18, has, uh, has interest and feels like the Lord is speaking to him in that direction that he might become the lead pastor here. He would be 33 at that time. You know, when you're 20, you're invincible, right? You're bulletproof and you know everything. But, but you lack experience and practical wisdom. And then in your 30s, you start saying something like this. Maybe my parents weren't crazy. Maybe there's, maybe there's some trueness to what they were saying. You gain a little humility. You recognize what you don't know. And then when you're 40, it all goes downhill from there. You know, <laughs> the Bible says that the promise is long life and health. Amen? Long life and health. So I'm going to give you a little snapshot of where we've been and where we're going. You'll just see this on the screen. Uh, 2003, we merged churches. I left a local church here, and, and we grew a church in two years. is miraculous to 1,000 people. And, and uh, in 2005, the Point Church and Crosstown Community Church merged, which is here, and uh, became the Crossing. And it was 1,000 uh, here and 1,000 that we brought. It was amazing. God did awesome things. 2012, we went into a building complex in South Shore with the campus, and then 2019, we built the building, bought the property, and, and uh, South Shore is beautiful, you guys. I mean, you should be clapping, man, down there. It's amazing. It's awesome. 2019, you can join them, Tampa. That's cool. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> also, in 2019, was a little jump there. We planted, uh, got the building in Plant City and started that campus. And we started it, oh, three months before COVID. So that was amazing. We just had to close right away. We love you, PC. You guys are doing amazing. So uh, 24, praise Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm back. God's good. 25 and 26, we're going to finish uh, the Plant City building, what God's doing there. 27, 28, we'll start the fifth campus and say, how, how are we counting? Three, and we have an online campus. And then 2024, we'll keep building for campuses. <clears throat> okay? Yeah, God's good. You can clap. Go for it, man. Go for it. All right, um, the reason why it looks like that is because uh, God said. And I think it's very important that uh, especially leaders, uh, ministers, wouldn't come up, on things, come up with things on their own. Uh, I was leaving, I went back to the church that sent me, uh, this was years ago, and I was leaving, I was driving out, and the Lord stopped me in the parking lot. And um, he said, turn around. And I had helped build the church. And what I mean by that is that I ran life groups and we loved people and connected with them and knew them and grew them and all the stuff. And we're looking at, how many of you know the church isn't the building? 
you are the church. You're the church. And at that time, there were about 2,000 people at that particular church. And as I stood there, the Lord spoke to me so clearly. And he said, I, I have given you or I will give you 10 times this. And, and so we took that number, it's a big number, we took that number and then we multiplied it over years and you know what I mean, if, when I'm 70, I'll just be getting started in life. When I'm 70, I'll probably be landing and handing off to somebody and, and that's how we came up with the campuses, the number and so on. I just want you to know that it, it, it does matter that God said because otherwise you can't take that check to the bank. You, you have to take checks to the bank that God gave you. Um, so, uh, our plan, uh, is the campuses and what God is doing. So we have a a vision, simple reach and teach. Our plan is 15 campuses in 15 years uh, from the word of God. And our process is very simple. Um, what you see hanging in the lobbies of all three of the campuses, it's like, it says this kingdom, prayer, people, and presence. So we used to call it KP3, right? Um, and, I, and I thinking through this and praying and listening to our staff, I, I think we're, cha- we're going to change. We're just going to change the order of how we have them. We're not changing the things. We're changing the order. And we're going to start first with prayer. <clears throat> prayer and then presence and then people and then kingdom. Okay? And prayer is the environment where we meet God. I know that we think prayer is like, it's, you know, how do I pray? How do, you pray the way you talk to somebody. You, you find a space and you begin to pray. It's the environment in which, you know, there's human beings. I could just go on and ramble. Human beings have an opening right here. Just go look it up. And when you sit, when you get, when you, I was, I really was going to reach for my phone. I don't have it with me. But when you get rid of that thing and you turn the TV off for a second and you just worship and you pray, that's the place where you start to feel and understand and hear God. Hear God. It's normal. I want to tell you, it's normal for Christians to hear their Heavenly Father. It's normal for Christians to hear the direction of the Lord. It's normal. It's normal. And so that's the presence part and the presence part is, is this amazing thing that happens when you know God, who is transcendent, transcends time and space, and is with you. That's the presence of God. That's why uh, we have a mission statement that says, we, the mission statement was to uh, develop fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. You know, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. But we added fully devoted, spirit-filled followers of Jesus Christ. And here's what I firmly believe. I believe that every person needs the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit to help you in your marriage and to help you physically and emotionally and spiritually. And if if, if Christians are ever going to find a space where we begin to influence and change culture, we have to have the power of God to do it. We have to. We, we have to. If you want to look at places around the world where the gospel is like raging, it's on fire, every single one of them are spirit-filled. There's not an exception. They're spirit-filled, which means there's that extra space where you'd say, God, I need your spirit in me to find your presence. I, I have to. I have to do it. That's why we're majoring in our uh, crossing college. There's the school of biblical study. That's the logos where you learn the scripture. And then there is the implementation portion where you learn how to pray for people. We teach you how to pray. This is how to pray. Wouldn't it be amazing if you went to work and you were hosting? I think the most important thing a Christian can do is host the spirit of God. Host the spirit of God. Wouldn't it be amazing if you go to work and instead of joining the talk at the cooler, not that that ever happens where you work. Instead of joining the cooler talk, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you have a word for somebody and you see their life changed. 
amazing. Somebody comes in and they need healing for whatever the healing process is, and you pray. How many of you would love to pray for someone and see them healed? Ooh, Lord Jesus. That's what the school does. It teaches you. One's the log off side. One's the implementation side. Here's the word. Here's the basis. Just put it in here. Now I want you to use your hands and I want you to go minister the gospel. Prepare people for the works of service. That's what the church is designed to do. That's why we're here. Prayer, presence. The other day, <clears throat> uh, after First Wednesday, you know, First Wednesday was fun. I was running around like a kid in a candy shop. I mean, I was, I just couldn't, I, was, I couldn't stay still. I mean, I had, I had, uh, I just could not. I was just, I literally felt like I had lightning. I was like jumping around. And um, the next day, on Thursday, the same group came and, and we had some worship time and we were together and um, we started to worship. And as I was praying, I felt, I felt a weight and um, how many of you know that the presence of God has weight? Has weight. Okay, let me describe it like this. If you had your eyes closed and you were in a room, uh, lit or dark, it doesn't really matter, and someone who is very large comes into the room and gets next to you, would you feel their presence? Yeah, we, we, we autonomically feel the presence. The presence of God is very similar. You can feel the weight of his person. And so as we're praying, I had my hands like this, and I feel weight on my hands, and I, I thought Pastor Jonas put his hands on my hands. So I opened my eyes, and some of you are going to think I'm kooky for telling you this, but I hope to close the loop, and I see a light. It's blue, but it's kind of effervescent. And I say to the Lord, what is this? Because you always want to ask the question, What's happening? And he said, I saved you. And, and if you're brand new, I had a really difficult health situation, and the Lord has delivered me out of it. I really, I really, I'm just a crazy, 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 crazy. Okay, so he said, I saved you. <clears throat> when I got saved 33 years ago, I was in my room, uh, and I called out to God, and when I put my hands up, I saw the same light. And it was a bluish kind of white color. And um, it's the recognition. I didn't have a second salvation. Are you with me? But I recognized that I was saved again. That's the presence of God. That's, that's God speaking. That's God moving. That's God. I left. I don't know if some of you can testify to this. The rest of the day, I babbled. I was just like, da, 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 da. Because when you have an encounter with God like that, everything in your system almost, it just overloads your whole system. This is, this is just amazing, amazing. And then people, you know, people are the prize of God. People are literally the prize of God, who God wants and desires, the prize. And years ago, <clears throat> I was teaching on sexuality in the month of June. You making the connection? And... By the way, let me say this. Anybody in any circumstance, in any situation is not just welcome here at the crossing, but we love every single person in every situation. Every. What we, what we don't do is we don't wink at sin. We love people enough to speak the truth in love. We love. We love everyone. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. Please get that in your mind. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone is welcome here. And everyone is welcome to hear that Jesus has a better plan. Jesus has the, be Jesus has the plan. He has the best plan. So I was teaching on sexuality. There's two ladies, probably in their late 20s. And you know, when you're teaching, you kind of remember where they're sitting and um, there were obviously a couple, they were together. <clears throat> I preached the gospel, I gave the invitation, they stood up to receive Jesus, and they gave their lives to Christ, radically gave their lives to Jesus. And then they had a life group leader who mentored them. Praise God for life group leaders, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you, church. And so as we get bigger, we've gotta get smaller. 
So a man and his wife mentored them and loved them and encouraged them and spent time with them and went to lunch with them and taught them the word of God and showed them, you know, every Christian should do this. We would say, well, my parents said this. And we said, but the word says this. Is it my family did this? Yeah, but the word says this. Right? But I used to act like this, but the scripture says this. And the good thing about Christianity is it doesn't leave you powerless to do it on your own. It's the spirit of God in you to do it. It's the spirit of God in you to change. So these two ladies, they eventually separated checking accounts, which is a big deal. They came to us. They were both very, very emotional. They separated checking accounts. Big deals. Can I get an amen? amen. Some of you are like, oh, you separated checking accounts. You know, if you're, <laughs> I could start stepping on toes a lot right now. Which is, <laughs> uh, separated checking accounts, and then they moved out. And the one lady... Um, got married and has three kids. I was just doing beautiful. She's just beautiful. The other lady got married to Jesus and served in full-time ministry. She's in missions all around the world. So I think we think I think we think we shouldn't get involved. But it's just the opposite. Every person, the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Heterosexual, homosexual, right? We've, we, we get these terms and we get afraid. But here's what I want to tell you. Jesus died for sinners. He died for me. He died for me. He died for you. He died. He. Well, I could just. Man, I could just. Whew, I'm getting messed up. I really, I really am because. Here's what I think we're taught. Don't talk about politics, aren't we? You go, you know, the whole thing. When you go to dinner with your family, don't talk about politics. What's the other one? Don't talk about religion. Don't talk about sexuality. Definitely don't talk about money. Somebody will get stabbed at the table. Oh. Uh, That's right. That's right. A, a, a very, very faithful family at the Tampa campus saying, so what happened was really extraordinary because the mom of one of the girls who had been in a homosexual lifestyle for 40-something years radically gave her life to Jesus. I mean, she just, and she, listen, yeah, 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 come on. Let's do it. Let's do it. She, uh, Oh, I, I used to tease like this. She read her Bible more than you. I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm just making, I'm just teasing. Her, she wore her Bible out. She became one of the best Christians I've ever known. One of the, she wore her, she wore the pages in her Bible out. She read her Bible over and over and over and over and witnessed the people and saw them come to faith and Amazing. Amazing. So, so <clears throat> the last one is the kingdom. And the kingdom is the place where uh, God wants Christians who are hosting the presence of God. Now watch this. We're not mean. We're not arrogant. We're not out to hurt people. Uh, we're filled with love from the Father. And we love people so much that we're not willing that they would perish. If you believe the Bible, like if you believe that there is an afterlife, if you believe that Jesus died, if you believe that his blood cleanses humans, if you believe, if you, if you care about your sons and daughters and your marriage, you, you believe you're a person who, you know, we... How many of you have heard of this thing, separation of church and state? 
We, for decades, the church in America has said, separation of church is day, separation of church is day, separation of church is day. Well, what is it linked to? Money. Because if you're not separated of church and state, then you're going to lose your 501c3 and you're going to lose your tax status. And I'm not saying this. You, you can clap, but I'm, I, I'm not saying this to be arrogant. I'm not saying it. I, 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 am, I say it with a great deal of respect. Losing a 501c3 in our tax status isn't the worst thing that can happen to us. It's not. The worst thing that can happen to a church is that it dies spiritually. And that we, and that we are not salt and light. We're just fodder. So we have a Christian name. We just don't have any Christian efficacy. There's nothing in us that makes us salt and light. There's nothing in us that makes us matter. There's nothing in us that makes us care. And all of that comes, you say, where do I get that stuff? In prayer. How do I feel something I don't feel right now? The presence of God. And when you're in prayer and with the presence of God, all of a sudden you'll start loving people. And somebody that you hated, not that anybody in here hates anybody, you love. Like you love enough to make a difference. You love enough to get in there. You love enough to do something. You love enough to move out of your comfort zone. You love enough. You love. And the kingdom is the place where Christians are supposed to make an impact. Separation of church and state was developed so the state wouldn't infringe on the rights of the church. But we flipped it around. That's why, that's why when churches opened after it was safe and COVID, we found out what COVID is and all that stuff. You remember, <clears throat> you know that COVID was treated like the black plague. Now, I'm not trying to get you guys riled up or separate each other, you know, gators, FSU. I'm not trying to do that. <laughs> because you have people who are ever, were ever maskers and people who were never maskers. And if you found each other in the parking lot, you want to hurt each other. That's not what I mean. What I mean is we have to actually understand what's going on. The percentage of people who were perishing was .0001. But we were treating it like it was the Black Plague, which killed 75% of the population. And so the first group they came after was churches. The very first group. And so it is unconstitutional for the government to come in, the separation of church and state is unconstitutional for the government to tell the church what to do. Why? You say, Pastor, why? Because during a plague, you need people serving other people. When things are on fire, you need people who run into the fire, not away from the fire. When people don't have food, you need people serving other people food. You, the church has always been the church. The church will always be the church. The Bible has always been the Bible. Jesus has always been the Savior. He's always been the Lord. So I've got a little, a little activation here for you. And it's very, very simple. <clears throat> it's a little voting card, all right, for the primaries. And we've had this checked out, Protect Our Children Project. And you can go on our website and find that. The state, the black United States is a group of pastors, one of the largest ones in America. And so what these two organizations have done is they're vetting, vetting candidates. And they're vetting candidates to understand where they stand with this, with this. I believe in my soul that we need to return to God. Amen. We need to return to the Lord. So that's where that comes from. Cody Powell is in our congregation. He's running for county commission. And uh, so I think that's wonderful. He's a strong incumbent. So you know what's crazy? Some of you are uncomfortable with me talking about it. <laughs> Lighten up. Let's loosen up. It's okay. It's okay. Um, what I'm saying is, is that I think every church in our nation should have people in it who desire to be on the county commission. 
How, how, how many of you believe the school board's important? <clears throat> Every church in the nation should be filling its local school board. Because I don't believe it's healthy to have men dressed as women. Yep. Hang on. I know we can get, ha, ah, ha, hang on. I don't think it's healthy to have men dressed as women, and I'm just, I'm just using that terminology, teaching our fourth graders that they can, they can have a surgical procedure to change their body. Which goes, all the way, which goes all the way, you know that that practice started in ancient Egypt? The gods of Egypt are in our nation. I just, I just don't think it's healthy. And so my advice to you is, you know, our, we, we have a vision, we have a plan, we have a, we have a process. My encouragement to the church is to just, how many of you grew up in the north? How about that? Sometimes it's a little difficult to get into a pool up north, isn't it? It's not as easy as it is in Florida. And I think we're in that season in our nation. And I just want to say to you what God is asking, I believe what God is asking, is for us to not linger in the shallow, but to come over here into the deep end and get in. To jump in. Jump in with Jesus. Jump in, jump in, jump in deep, and I'll make you a promise. It's easier in the shallow. That's where everybody has their drinks. I mean, they're Coca-Cola, it's Coke. Here's what I'll make you a promise. It's only in the deep end where you're gonna find the depths of the riches of the God you serve, only. It's only there. That's why we host things like Global Awakening that's coming two weeks from now. I want you to come. We want you to come. Because, here, and I'll finish with this. I'll finish like this. Experiencing God is beyond your experience right now. And it will take you out of your comfort zone. The first time that I, you remember praying in public for the first time? The first time I prayed in public, it came from a Catholic background, and, and I prayed in public like this. I thought I was going to get arrested. Someone's going to come arrest me while I'm speaking out loud in a public place for Jesus. I thought I was going to get arrested. The first time I prayed for somebody to be healed, I felt the same way. First time I preached the gospel. First time I saw somebody delivered. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. And right now, today, we're raising the dead. Right in this moment, we're raising the dead, raising the dead, raising the dead, praying that that the heartbeat would come back, that people would see, that we would hear, that we would understand, that we, would, that we wouldn't be cultural Christians, that we would be biblical Christians. That's the vision of the church. Amen? Let me pray with you. Father, we love you and thank you for this time. Across all of our campuses, we're just going to commit ourselves to Jesus. Would you say this out loud? And you don't have to yell it. We just, we just want you to say it. You know, we want your ears to hear it. Say, Lord Jesus, today I surrender. I give you my life. All of it. All of it. All the bad parts. All the broken parts. I give you all of me. I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I believe that you're Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed across all of our campuses, if you prayed for the very first time or you prayed recommitting your life to Jesus, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand nice and tall on the count of three. One, two, three. Just slip your hands up. Slip your hands up for us. Amen.